you know, all these papers is like having a handful of cards, but everything's still written so big. How's everybody doing? Good. Y'all happy to be here? Amen. Yeah. Amen. You know, you're talking about uh, somebody losing their child at 53. I'm going to tell you, I've learned that it don't matter how old you get, you lose your child. That's it. If I get to be 90-something years old and my child's 60-something years old and they go before me, I'm going to be devastated mm -hmm. because a child is a child. That's why I know there's so much power in the name of Jesus because for this day, as many thousands of years as it's been, I believe that it still moves God's heart the day he died. And gave his life. Some said, well, he's God in flesh and, and, and he knew he was going to raise. I don't care how well you know it's going to turn out. When your child suffers, it's something you don't want to go through. Mm -hmm. It's devastating. You know, I wanted to always say that once we have children, parents live in constant fear. But I, I, I had to re, reroute that and say that once we become parents, we live from that very moment in constant concern. We're not to worry as Christians, we're supposed to be concerned, though, aren't we? And I think anyone here that's a parent knows exactly what I'm talking about. But I also know that anybody here who has a nephew or a niece or a grandchild or, or a neighbor child, anyone they love, you know what I'm talking about. I'm close to 200 of them. Christians just know what it's like to love. But we don't know what it's like to love as God loves. Well, we will one day. We were, we were coming over here today, and I told Beverly I was going to use this. She said, I just wish I could see the whole picture of things. And I said, well, God's given us a book of paints, and sometimes he lets us paint our own picture. And if he has a picture already painted, we can open up this Bible, and we can see it just like we can see the Mona Lisa inside a museum. The problem with being a parent, though, is that sooner or later... That child who wanted to be all the time under your feet and close to you. I got two grandboys, and they stayed the weekend with us again. And if one brings me a picture and says, look what I did, I say, oh, that looks so good. The other one's running as quick as he can in there. And say, well, what about mine? Hmm. You know, because everything you say and do means the world to them. But as they get older, they don't start coming around as much. Hmm. And then our visits sort of resemble a little bit what God goes through with us. You know, uh, they're happy uh, to see us. And it's not that they don't love us, but they just got better things to do. <clears throat> you know, and, and, you know, we love them Thanksgiving dinners and we love them um, Christmas dinners and we get dressed up and, and we, we really enjoy going. But a lot of people, when they go to church, it's like I prayed this morning, it's like they're going to visit our loved ones in the retirement home. Don't mean that we don't love them. It don't mean we don't love God. We just got to find somewhere, somewhere else to be, somewhere else to go, because we just don't want to be in church. And we got to find a reason. I heard a preacher once say, he says, every time somebody comes up to me and says, I don't want to go to church because there ain't nothing but a bunch of hypocrites there. He says, well, come to mine. I got room for one more. <laughs> You know, we were talking about jokes, and I'm going to talk today about uh, the temple of God and how how it gets defiled and how people break into it. You know, there was a, and I think I might have, I know I heard this from a preacher, I might have heard it from Bill, but there was a, a man that broke into a house. He thought the people were gone. He didn't know anybody was there, and he heard, Jesus is watching you. And he stopped, and just that fear went over him, like, is there somebody with a gun? And what, what's happened to me? And then he, he heard it again. Jesus is watching you. And it was a, a parrot. The people's parrot. And he walked up there and said, Are you, Is your name Jesus? He said, No, my name's Harold. He said, Who in the world would name a parrot Harold? He said, The same people that named the Rottweiler Jesus. Uh, so, uh, you know, church and worship is ingrained into us. Y'all know that? It's ingrained into us. We have to worship. That's why there's so many gods and so, or false gods, I'll say, and so many different types of worship everywhere. It's ingrained in us that we have to worship. And that's why, if you've ever been in this position, and I know I have, when you feel like I need to be in church to worship, but you, you come up with an excuse not to be there, the excuse doesn't make you feel good on the inside. You still feel a little guilty. Because we're just, it's just ingrained in us to do that. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 
Verse 16, it says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. How many of y'all ever heard that before? And don't worry, I'm not going to call on you to elaborate. I'm just wondering, you know, yes or no. How I many of y'all have studied that? What does it mean to you? What does it mean to you to know that you are the temple of God? I'll be honest with you. I've been in some situations that I was going to put my body through and I, I was convicted. Remember, this is the temple of the Holy Spirit. This is the temple of God. And I had a choice to make. You know, like, like Solomon had a choice to make. Right? He married all these women and started worshiping these strange God. Here's another question I'm not going to have you elaborate on. Who thought that it was so ignorant for the wisest man in the world to worship strange gods? Does that not blow your mind? Oh my goodness, I just can't get over that. But you know what wisdom is? Wisdom is um, how you articulate your use of knowledge. Okay? And what we have, when we have a relationship with God, the Bible tells us if you know God, you're a wise person. Amen? Mm -hmm. I mean, wisdom cometh from the Lord. Fear the Lord uh, bringeth wisdom. Amen? So, without me going any further, don't be afraid. How many of y'all know God today? Amen. Praise God. So, y'all are wise in that way. How many of y'all still sin sometimes? So, are we any different than, than Solomon? Mm -hmm. God gave him wisdom, but he allowed him to keep his free will. And let me tell you something. Wisdom without discipline is like zeal without knowledge. Amen. Amen. You can be the wisest person in the world, but if you're not disciplined in what you know is right, you're still going to sin. With, you know, he built the temple, the first temple, the first big one. We can say God built the first one, amen? But he built the temple, and I was researching again, because I had a children's sermon. I don't know if y'all remember it. I, I talked to him about how much it cost, and it was in the billions of dollars, and I said, you're worth more than that, that temple to God, amen? I think we can all agree to that. But it was like three to six billion, and I'm thinking, who's coming up with these facts? There's a big difference between three and six billion dollars, is there not? I mean, I'm going to be honest with you, if, if, I, if I needed to, I could live off of one billion dollars. Just one, I don't even need three. You know? There's a big gap there, sort of like the, the time gap with dinosaurs. You ever notice that? This one lived 8 million years ago, and this one lived 800 million years ago. And I'm like, man, I'm a police officer. I've been a police officer for be 30 years this, fe this February 14th, and I know that at a certain point in death, <clears throat> you can't tell me within six hours when somebody died. Y'all ever heard of Dr. Death? He's famous. He's, he's a, a man who puts dead bodies out in different environments at the University of Tennessee, and, and he studies, you know, for forensics. You know, it, it, it's amazing. If you ever get a chance to, to look it up, look it up. He's, he's, a, he's an amazing man. But anyways. Um, it's called The Body Farm. The Body Farm, yes. So some of y'all in here probably believe in creation with evolution. Some of y'all might believe in in uh, just creation or just evolution. I tell people, I don't know if any of y'all have seen that latest video of mine, but it's very dangerous for Christians to allow their intelligence and their faith to fight. You know, whether you know it or not, there's a lot of evidence that supports evolution. A lot of evidence. A lot of factual evidence. But there is the same amount of evidence that supports creation. And I don't know if anybody's ever put this to you before or not. And this don't have much to do with my, my message, but I, I think God wants me to put this out there. But if you've got the same amount that supports evolution as you do creation, what do you have? You have a choice to make, right? And since it's something that you haven't seen, it's a choice of faith. Amen. Brother Bill, yes. when, when you say evolution, now, I'm not going to interrupt you too bad. Well, I mean, yeah. You're I'm, talking about organic evolution. Yes, right? I'm, I'm... Because evolution itself just means to change. It yeah, you know, I told him this morning he was smart. I should have done that. <laughs> 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 yeah, because we have an Arctic fox, we have a we have a desert fox, and we have a, a forest fox. 
And if either one of them would probably die within a week if they went to the other environment. But yet they come from their own kind. Amen? This virus is evolving right now. Yeah. It's changing. So, I just wanted to throw that out there. But, but Solomon built this temple. And let's say it cost $3 billion. That's a lot of money for one building. And we know the reason why, right? Teresa is the gold in it, right? I mean, there are rooms, that were, entire rooms that were covered with gold. I, I bet me and Teresa could have a 12-hour discussion on the temple, couldn't we? I'm talking about precious stones and gold and silver and precious woods. All of these treasures were inside of it. And the king of Assyria came to Hezekiah and said, I am going to destroy you and everything you've got unless you, you give up to me. And with one prayer, he said... Hezekiah, don't worry, they won't even shoot an arrow at you. And then sent the death angel, amen? King went back, he got killed. So, the point is, is that when he made this temple, he built walls, he fortified the army, watchtowers, did all these things to protect this temple and to let people know you don't go into that place because it's sacred, it's holy. But then Nebuchadnezzar comes by and he destroys the city, sacks the homes, uh, takes the people uh, as slaves, destroys the temple, and takes everything out of it. Everything that was precious to them, he took out of it. But what a lot of people don't know is that he actually seized four temples that day. Does anybody know the names of the other four, three temples? Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He took all the precious things out of the temple built by Solomon and left the building. He took the temples of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego with him, but he couldn't take the treasures out of them. See, the reason why the temple fell to Nebuchadnezzar is because what was inside of the temple wasn't worth defending in God's eyes. Because what was precious to God in that temple had been lost a long time before Nebuchadnezzar ever stepped foot on a porch. Idolatry, adultery, artificial sacrifices. What was precious to God was lost long before Nebuchadnezzar took it. But what was precious to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel was still precious to God. You know, the things inside that temple represented a place. One thing represented Christ, and that was the ark. Why? Because we had the manna, the bread of God. Jesus is the bread of life. We had the Aaron, the rod of Aaron, it always budded, who represented the Levite, the priesthood, and Jesus is our high priest. And we had the law of God, the Ten Commandments, the character of God, the character of Jesus Christ. That's the reason why the ark wasn't taken by Nebuchadnezzar. Because it was still precious in the eyes of God, because it represented Jesus. And that's the reason why they couldn't take away from Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego what they had, the treasures inside their temple, because it was a representation of Jesus. Amen. They denied the king's food. They denied bowing to another god. What was one of the, what was one of the things that, think about it, think about the, the, the uh, it's not a coincidence, but the, the parallel between Jesus, our Christ, and Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. What's the first temptation of Jesus in the desert? God just threw this at my mind. I, I, I thank and praise him so much in the name of Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. What was the first temptation of Jesus? Turn these stones into bread. Amen. What was the first temptation of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Eat of this food from the king's table. Amen. What was the other temptation of Jesus? Bow and worship me and I'll give you all this. Bow to this man and you'll be able to keep your temple. You'll be able to keep your life. No, I'm not going to do it. You see the correlation between the, the two? They were representations of Jesus Christ. It was very important. He couldn't take them uh, things. And I've already done passed up two pages, I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, we put locks on our houses. Now, I'm sure you all heard this preached 100,000 times probably. But I'll preach it again. We put locks on our houses. But what good do locks do if we don't have walls? We could have a framed door out there locked with the best lock in the world. If we don't have walls, they're still going to come in and take everything. Amen? You know, we lock up what's precious to us. That's why you don't see locks on outhouses. We, we lock up what's precious. I've got 
as we left today, I opened up the door to walk out and I jingled that handle to make sure that it was locked. And my German Shepherd sits on my front porch. And if she hears something, she'll go find out what it is. Now I know that if an honest person was to come by my house or somebody that's afraid of dogs come by my house, I don't have to worry about them breaking in. But there's always somebody that's not afraid of a dog and they don't care about locked doors. That's why my true trust is in God. Amen? Now what if somebody breaks in my house and I go home and it's already checked? Well, all things work for the good of those that love the Lord and there's a reason for it. And God knows the reason and he'll show me the picture. Amen? Amen. The easiest way to conquer anything is from the inside. That's why as Christians we got to understand that this temple is always attacked by Satan. Mm -hmm. We talk to ourselves worse than anybody else. We cut ourselves down worse than anybody else. We ransack our own temple and defile it with our thoughts more than anyone else does. And it's a shame that we allow an open door to Satan inside our minds and our hearts so often. Saying we're not pretty enough, we're not smart enough, we're not good enough, we're not fast enough, we're not this, we're not that. And we go back to being children of the milk instead of adults with the, with the meat, like my grandchildren, trying to get God to tell us that we're good, that he still loves us. When the word says he'll never leave nor forsake us, why do we still have to ask him, am I still okay in your eyes? Were we okay before we got saved, and yet he still saved us? Amen? So the question is, if the temple wasn't worth defending and it was taken by Nebuchadnezzar, but what was worth defending that was precious in God's eyes was precious in the temple's eyes, how much is your faith today worth to God? In a balance of, of the faith that Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had, how does your faith measure with their faith? How does your trust measure to theirs? What is your fruits worth? You know, when they built a vineyard back then, they, they built it right. They, they put a wall around it so that the animals couldn't get into it. And it let people know, hey, you know what? There's a wall there. You don't cross the wall. That's just the law. I'm sure they had sheds. They definitely had the wine presses. They had everything they needed there to take care of that. What is your wall like? You know, if, you, if your body is a temple of God, then you have a wall around you. Who protects it? And is what's inside worth protecting? The Bible says in Proverbs 25, 28, He that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. You know, it is easier to conquer something. Abraham Lincoln said after, after the Civil War, that after he saw the might of the people and the industrial strength of the nation, that no one could conquer the United States except they conquered from within. And we see that happening today, don't we? You know, Adam and Eve, that apple was an outward sign of rebellion. It wasn't until they desired it in their heart and put it inside them that it became sin and killed them. Samson, his hair was an outside reflection of a vow. You know what a lot of people say? It was his hair. It wasn't his hair. It was the vow. And he had a lot of vows as a Nazarite. You know, I really believe he could have cut his hair first and still had the other vows and still had his strength. His hair just happened to be the last vow that he didn't break, amen? He touched dead bodies. He committed adultery. He went after prostitutes. He drank alcohol. So if he had cut his hair first and still not done the other things, could he have remained his strength? I believe so. It just so happens that that was the last thing. And I often wonder if that last vow was only there because of his vanity. Because a lot of times we'll do things for God just because it makes us look good. Instead of what it'll do for the people we're trying to help. You know? But she cut his hair. And when did she cut it? She cut it after he fell asleep. You know what? Jesus, when he was with his disciples, he did everything for them. Y'all ever notice that? Do you think that the 5,000 were the only ones that didn't eat that day? Or had, had struggled with him for them many days and didn't eat? The disciples probably didn't eat either, did they? Because it wasn't like they carried around a refrigerator with them. So when he fed the 5,000, the disciples ate along with them. 
When they were in that boat alone and that storm came and he was walking on the water, he cared for them. When he was in the bottom of the ship and the ship was being tossed to and fro and they went to him and said, Jesus, don't you care that we die? He calmed the sea. He was always there for them. But the one time, the one time Jesus needed them, he walked up to him and he says, I'm in deep distress. I've got a heavy load and I'm really hurting and I need your help. Please come with me and pray. What did they do? They fell asleep. And a lot of people are falling asleep at church today spiritually. And I know you've heard that a thousand times. It's like, there's time, I heard a preacher once say, he says, I'm going to preach this again because I know that some of y'all didn't get it last time because you were asleep. <laughs> Satan knows that he has more than one temple to destroy to get rid of Christianity. Did you ever notice that when uh, the, the uh, Sodom and Gomorrah and, and God said, I, for ten righteous, I'll not destroy the city? It wasn't to help the unrighteous, it was to help the righteous. We said, why does God want so much evil in the world? Because there's a little bit of good in the world that's worth saving. Okay? There's a little bit of good still left that's worth saving. That's why he hasn't destroyed it. If you have walls, what are they made of? Does it matter? God sent Hezekiah to build a wall out of burnt rubble. He managed to build a wall. He used a wall of water, one of the most flexible and inconsistent things in the world. He built a wall of water so that the children of Israel with Moses could walk through. Amen? It doesn't matter what you think you got or you don't got. If you ask God to help you build that wall, it'll be impregnable. What about the wall, of uh, the invisible wall that Job had that Satan said, I can't get through it? Amen? The temple that we have inside of us was not built by man's hands. Neither is the wall outside of us. And no one can get us out of his hand. Did he pray, promises that? No one can take that out of my hand. And no one can take that out of my father's hand. That's a wall there. How many of y'all know who John Wesley is? Hey, man. You haven't seen the Methodist raise her hand. What's up with that? I was shaking my head. <laughs> yes. Don't care what your religion is. If you ever studied that man's life, he is a, he is a great man. They said in his lifetime that they believed that he rode over 250,000 miles. I don't understand how that's possible. They said his, his brother wrote, I don't know how many, 30,000 songs. And they call them Methodists because they have a method of doing things. He was a priest in the Church of England. And then he noticed things were going wrong. See, the Church of England was formed when Henry VIII decided that he wanted to find a church, when the Pope said, you're living a sinful, adulterous life, you can't live that way and go to heaven, he made his own church. He separated from the Catholic Church. How many people do you think today are trying to find a church that allows them to do what they want because if the church says it's okay, then God's obligated to say it's okay. Hmm. So he makes this church, the Church of England. Now, I do believe that there were, there were Christians in this church. I believe there were Christians people wanting to worship God. But the problem was, is that it was a combination of church and politics. And that was by the means that they crucified Jesus Christ. By church and politics. He said he was our God, he says he's your king, Caesar. And he ain't Caesar, he ain't our God. That's what they said. So, he got to noticing that the church wouldn't allow certain people through the doors. If they didn't look right, if they didn't have the right title, if they weren't dressed right, if they didn't smell right, they weren't allowed inside the church. So they were preaching the word of God in the church, but they weren't practicing it outside of the church. Matthew 23, 1 through 3 says, Then Jesus spake to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Now y'all bear with me, because I've messed this up many times. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do, but do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. In other words, they don't practice what they preach. So do what they tell you from the Bible, but don't do as they do, because they, they do sinful things. Amen. He saw this in the Church of England. I don't know what it's like now, but at that time, that's what he saw. Instead of feeding the hungry and clothing the, the naked and, and visiting those that were sick and in prison, he was influenced by a Calvinist. And this Calvinist name was George Whitfield, 
who went out to prisons and preached in the prisons and preached in the hospitals and preached at the factories. And to Wesley, that was strange because worship was formal. He wasn't behind a pulpit. And he got passionate about his preaching. Sometimes he'd yell, get loud, cry. Well, that was beneath a priest. But then he finally realized that what he was doing is that he was feeding them hungry people. The bread of life. And then he realized that the Church of England was putting the, the name victim on those that were less fortunate than them. Why? Because when you give somebody the title victim, then if you can justify why they're a victim, you don't have to help them. You see, they were a victim of their heritage, of the economic situation, of their social system. They were victims of all these other things, and because they were victims, they were victims by their own hand. They were suffering for the sins of their fathers. And because it's not our fault, because it's not the church's fault, and you just happen to fall in this category of victims, we're not obligated to help you. But John Wesley, as George Whitfield and so many others, said, no, that's, we preach Jesus on the outside with our works, inside with our mouths, but outside with our works. And John Wesley said, there is no such thing as a victim, because with Jesus, we have victory in him. And there are no victims within the walls of Christ. There are disciples and warriors, amen? Because when you label somebody a victim, and you give them that title, they feel like they're, they're either not deserving or don't have to rise up above that. And then you get these people that want to advocate for the victim. They want to tell you that you should give them more, but they don't want to give anything. And the government is famous for this. And I always say, don't put politics in your pulpit. I'm just using this example. I'm not going to tell you anything about liberal, democrat, or conservative, or whatever. I'm just going to tell you that they're the best example of saying, we need to give more to the poor, but we don't want to give anything from our own pocket. Wesley didn't believe in that. And I hope you don't either. If you see somebody hungry, feed them. If God tells you to go to somebody who's sick, go to them. In prison, go to them. I know it's hard now, but that, that don't mean we can't do it. God could have took the apple out of the hand of Adam and Eve. God could have took the, the stew out of the hand of Esau. He could have took the scissors out of Delilah's hand. He could have done a lot of it, all, all these things. He could have done it. But the problem was, with the heart, Adam and Eve sinned. Samson gave in. Esau didn't care about his birthright. So what was precious to them wasn't precious to God. So why defend something that you could care less about? God will defend you. He will brighten and enrich in your temple, and he will build walls around you that Satan and no one else can penetrate, unless he allows it, and there are times when he will. But he's not going to take away your free will. Even the wisest man in the world had that opportunity. And he went what way? Away from God. And the very man that sacked the temple and took the riches and took the other three temples wound up being a servant of God. How ironic is that? Father God, we thank you for this time that we have together. We thank you, God, for the ability through your son, Jesus Christ, to come to your throne, God, as precious it is, as it is. As unworthy as we feel we are, we were still worth something because you gave your son for us and you, you hate the deceit and unbalanced scales. So for whatever reason, we thank you. But we know that we are made in your image and that image, God, is one of the reasons why you never gave up on us. And we thank and praise you for that. We should be able to see your image and worth in everyone. No matter what their lifestyle is, no matter how they want to live their life, no matter whether they agree or disagree with our religious beliefs, everyone is worth something and everyone deserves your love. And help us to reflect that in Jesus Christ. Help us not to be a reflection of what's in the temple that represents a place of God, what's in the temple that represents Jesus Christ. And we ask this in his name. Amen. 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 291.